Good morning. Uh, my name is Brenda Henderson. I am your Master of Ceremonies for today. Welcome to the Women in Payments Conference. I'm sure you're all very excited and really looking forward to today's events. Flexco produces ideas and it produces services which are based on ideas. And for Flexco to be successful, we have to be a company which can, which can take the best ideas and not be too precious about where they come from. And in order to, to be able to do that, it's really important that, we, that, that the company is diverse. Because it's very obvious to me that it doesn't really matter who you are. Uh, it, doesn't matter, it doesn't matter where you come from, what gender you are. Everyone is able and, and has the capability to come up with, with, with really good ideas and really outstanding work. One of the key things that, that, that a company that, 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 that kind of enables and celebrates diversity gives is trust. And Fexco is based on teams. And for teams to function well, there has to be trust. So that, again, is, is, is a really important word. A word of trust is one that is very difficult to achieve if you, if you are working in, 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 a, in a company or a team that discriminates. It's, trust disappears. So in order for this company to have trust, it's important that people feel valued for, for what they bring to the table. Well, today is testament to what we can achieve when we all pull together and have an interesting idea and turn it into something tangible. So I'd like to give you all a very warm welcome on behalf of the Fexco Women in Payments Network to our inaugural event here today, an event that I hope will become a firm fixture on the, on the Fexco calendar. Creating diversity and inclusion in the fintech sector isn't just a new concept, it isn't the latest buzzword. It needs no explanation and it really needs no persuasion. Today will be, and already is, a huge success because we, as a network, as a collective, have taken a seat at the table. We're shining a light on why diversity and inclusion is not only good for us as individuals, but it is good for business. Inclusion brings us a different, a different team. It brings us talent. It means greater skills and different perspectives. It allows us to bring innovation by allowing us to work together collaboratively and focus on each other's strengths. It not only increases employee productivity, morale, but it also ensures that inclusion is a priority. Our network, the Fexco Women in Payments Network, aims to nurture this. It aims to promote an inclusive environment and ensure that these values are promoted because they are at the heart of the Fexco DNA. Happily, diversity and respect for the individual are two of the foundations upon which Fexco was built when it was founded 40 years ago. In the early years, Fexco had a different way of expressing and implementing this core value of diversity. Ever before, the kind of terms like intersectionality of difference and privilege were commonplace words as they are today, Fexco took great care to employ and integrate people of all backgrounds into the company. That commitment to enabling people with different abilities and different perspectives to work as a team together was a big part of why the company has been so successful. Indeed, indeed within that, women have always played a very influential role in the growth of the company. I can't begin to list out the strong women who've been core to Fexco, as there are just so many. And it's a privilege to be part of celebrating their contribution to date and also discussing how to further support them in the, this phase of the company's development. If you want to be successful in your career, you need to believe yourself that you can do it and believe in your own strengths and know what your own strengths are. People tend to sit in their seat and assume that they're going to be promoted or assume that you know, their, their work is going to be noted, but uh, it doesn't happen. You have to mm -hmm. let people know what you're doing. You have to communicate that. And you know, I always say to people, pick up the phone. If, if there's someone you admire in the industry, pick up the phone and ask to meet them for coffee. You know, generally, people will say yes if they have the, the time. And just you know, even going to talk to someone for an hour about their career path and just getting you know, advice. I can't kind of emphasize enough how important events like these are to engage all of your workforce. So thank you for inviting us and being here. It's brilliant. And the more we can do, I think the better we're going to make our workplaces for everyone, really. 
So in terms of collaboration, I think, you know, the word co-opetition, frenemy, um, these words now um, resonate um, very, very firmly with me um, in terms of the fact that we do now have to run with the hare and hunt with the hound. We do have to work with potentially partners um, and indeed competitors that perhaps maybe in, uh, in previous years have taken market share from us. And that's, a, that's an interesting one because I think without partnerships in payments, the customer, the end mm. user, be it a consumer or be it a business, will suffer. And I think if you look at the P&L and the expectations of shareholders um, and the markets, it is expected that we will continue to serve customers irrespective of their requirements. And I think innovation is the only way that you can do that to meet the expectations of customers going forward. So PSD2 has been heralded as a transformational piece of legislation. It's going to change banking as we know it. I think fundamentally PSD2, the basis for it was to, to um, encourage innovation. Um, and similarly in the UK, which we've seen with the open banking, um, you know, intention being to open the playing field to new competitors, um, to make payments more efficient for consumers, um, and to provide opportunity for innovation. And um, I believe that this, you know, the, the regulation it was necessary. I think you know anybody uh, who's worked in, in banking or in payments traditionally um, knows that it was difficult for new competitors to, to enter, particularly the banking space. Just understanding what the highlights of PSD2 is or are. Um, the first point, the extension of scope, it traditionally just dealt with euro payments. So now we're looking at applying it to all currency payments uh, within the union and then the one leg in or out, so the, the element of a payment that's within the union. Uh, the notion of better customer protection or consumer protection, the refund rights, etc., within there to try and indicate to consumers or get them more used to electronic payments and that it's safe. Um, under PSD1, Ireland seemed to struggle a little bit on purpose with what immediate refund meant. So PSD2 rewrote that line on a touch of do you not understand immediate, so it's now very, very clearly next day refund. Uh, for customers, and again, designed to encourage them to, to get to grips with the online payments. Strong customer authentication, this multi-factor, again, the security background, um, which I think is going to rain on the parade of those earlier who are hoping for nice, slick, fast consumer payments. Um, the banks and I think fintechs, everybody will struggle with what strong customer authentication is actually going to mean in real terms. Um, I agree that anyone who figures it out and can get it into a nice, slick, seamless, background arrangement so that customers can, can, can easily make those payments will be the king. But in the initial stages, I think it's just going to be clunky and awkward for customers and it's going to be interesting to see how that pays out. Uh, I'm not sure they'll necessarily appreciate it because they do just want to make payments. Uh, but that security background which is being enforced uh, is going to upset things. And the last bit of the most fundamental element of PSD2 are the introduction of these third party providers, bringing them into the regulated environment, opening up data which the banks would have traditionally regarded as their data. It's now very much been seen as the customer's data. It's to be available, it's to be shared, and that's to be the linchpin or the, or the background for a lot of the innovation that, that PSD2 hopes to drive. Um, just a quick question in regards to the uh, two-factor authentication. Um, who is it there really to serve? Is it for the consumer or is it just to stop fraud? And do we see it as a good thing or as the European Commission potentially overstepped their mark. Frank, go for it. Yeah. <laughs> um, it's, it's, not good for, well, it's not good for the consumer uh, in terms of the ability to actually make a payment. It is good for the consumer from an anti-fraud or a, yeah. a security perspective. So depending on which lens you look at, <clears throat> I, I, I see the Commission's more immediate point of view as being an anti-fraud. Um, people will struggle with it in the, in the first instance as they figure how to roll it out. Um, for, for people who have biometrics and can use thumbprints, that's great, but the, the proliferation of smartphones with that technology is, is increasing, but not everybody has access to those. So you're relying then on SMS and a variety of other clunky pieces. So it, it, it's going to be a blocker, but it is, has arrived with an anti-fraud hat on, not a consumer-friendly one. 
Um, another big theme, I suppose, that I'm kind of reading about more is the whole area of cognitive diversity, which is really around thoughts and opinions. You know, how can you make teams more diverse by getting people into your teams that have, you know, a lot of different ideas and ways of thinking? And one way people can do that is if somebody leaves their team and they can think about, okay, instead of just hiring in their own likeness, again, a very similar, you know, profile of person because it's similar to themselves, how can they kind of go beyond their kind of comfort zone and actually think about who do they you know, can they get a different perspective, somebody that's different yes. in terms of thoughts and ideas? And it links in, and I'm sure Carl and his panel later on will be talking about the whole area of innovation. And really around innovation, you know, if organizations don't change and get new ideas and new opinions into teams, stagnation will occur and it's very bad for innovation. So I think the whole area of cognitive diversity is important. I'm all, we're also struck by the lack of coalitions amongst females in the workplace. Uh, I, we run a program, Merging Female Leaders. We purposely do that because we figure a lot of female leaders who are established actually have a lot of networks. We run a program for emerging female leaders, typically 25 to 35, and we talk about putting the elevator back down. And one of the things they said was, people don't really do that. And I find that interesting. And coalitions, I find, quite honestly, I mean, females can actually hold each other back rather than form coalitions and I think that mentoring is hugely important for that and forming kind of alumni out of leadership development programs or forming alumni out of master classes around just actually supporting each other. Our best people are our women and so particularly in, in a business which is about building relationships which is the key and building trust which is the key thing for, for, for the likes of our business. Yeah. We do see the importance of having kind of a structured um, um, forum or place for the male allies and what we've heard today from some of the casual conversations is a lot of the men don't even know how to be part of a women's network. They're all eager but they just need maybe needed a little bit of kind of guidance on how to get involved so I think it is very promising. Be aware of who you are. Talk about your brand Chris you know make sure that you're aware um, of who, the, who, who those are around you that can influence and support you and use those. We haven't come as far as we need to come and one of the things that we know from our research, um, our research as recent as 2018 is that women are not thriving as much in the workplace as they should be. So when you see some of these stats, only 18% of, of women are likely to reach manager as men. So that's quite staggering in terms of a really low figure. For every man who reach manager, only 56% of women reach managers. The organizations who have diversity targets, the women much, do much, much better there. And of the 14 global Fortune 500, of whom I have the privilege of working with quite a few, very few have women in senior positions. Only 27% 20, of organizations today publish their diversity statistics. Now you will hear a lot of organizations say, we don't believe in metrics, we don't believe in quotas. But actually we know the companies that have metrics tend to perform better in this space. In terms of actions that solve for equality, we say equality because actually, uh, to many of the points that were made earlier, a lot of the actions that we put in place not only benefit women, but actually benefit men and the workforce in general. Um, it's really interesting when you look at some of the research around maternity leave. When organizations introduce maternity leave, and that is all they do, performance of women and progression of women is actually detrimental. Women are held back if that's the only thing that's in place, which is almost counterintuitive because you think maternity leave is good. When organizations have paternity leave or parental leave, actually both men and women progress quicker. We know when you put practices in place that enforce and empower people, around certain things like sexual discrimination and other discrimination that organizations and women in general do much, much better. Um, training and development is, is really important. I think we talked a lot this morning about things like unconscious bias. Unconscious bias is real and it's not just in relation to gender, it's in relation to age, sex, sexual orientation. It can be everything down to weight. How does diversity now drive innovation within an organization? And interesting what we find is that it's not about diversity, it's actually about having a culture of equality. Even on, you know, in, in teams, uh, you know, small groups of people, whether they be working on a problem or a product or whatever it happens to be, uh, all, all too often we end up grouping people who are too similar. Um, whether that's, you know, gender, ethnicity, age, experience. you know, socio demographic, you know, experience. But I think we need to look at teams, uh, you know, through a different lens, through, you know, we, we want to, every team, you want to bring in dreamers, you want to bring in critics, you want to bring in realists. And when they work together, they can, they can drive some, some fabulous change. If you have equality, people will feel like they're 
contribution matters and whether that's an idea because there's Absolutely. lots of ideas that never see the light of day because people don't feel them empowered or in an equal position to mm. speak irrespective of your rank or your position um, so I think that's that's really Absolutely. important so nearly three years ago I was smacked by a major life change the job and the team that I loved was made redundant was I devastated did I panic completely the opposite I thought to myself this could lead to something even better I could respond with optimism because I was comfortable outside my comfort zone. The comfort zone is a place or a situation where we feel at ease and we're at calm and we cling to this space because it's safe and predictable. But actually, that could be the thing that's holding us back. And if we're willing to step outside of the comfort zone, take some risks and push ourselves, that's when the magic really happens. Now, being comfortable with discomfort doesn't come naturally. But the good news is, it's a learned behavior. We, as MasterCard, try to do is focus more like how can we move past that card or card-linked payments and how can we capture the new payment flows. So if we want a secure future, where we want people to be able to transact in these crazy 5G IoT environments in safety, we need to found that on relationships. And so I've just put up a few examples here. To, this is an old diagram, but I just like the diagram. Because we, you know, we tend to think about sort of Uber and Airbnb. They're the examples we use for everything. But actually, there are thousands of examples of these kinds of new marketplaces springing up where the ability to take a reputation from one place and move it to another actually enables completely new kinds of commerce. It enables transactions to take place. And one of the odd things about well, not odd thing about it, but I, I saw the futurologist um, Heather Vesson present about this a few years ago. She left a really strong impression on me. So she said, when you, when you have an Uber or an Airbnb or something, the payment itself never becomes part of the interaction mm -hmm. and so somehow the nature of the transaction changes because you you actually don't have payment sort of kind of interrupting the transaction it, it changes the kind of emotional content of it and that's a really interesting way of looking at these sort of new marketplaces of the future but what i'm saying here is in order for that to happen you have to have this recognition mm -hmm. in order for that to work properly it has to develop these relationships that run across all the channels and what I'm saying is the history of those relationships in that environment suddenly becomes the most important strategic context. Like the people that control that control the most important lever. Have you seen any pushback in, in the Nordics in recent times or is it all moving towards greater equality? I think definitely moving towards greater equality, especially one of the bigger things that have happened is parental leave. Mm -hmm. You know, I think that more people are now uh, men are taking three or four months of parental leave. We're seeing more and more there's a, definitely a business case for diversity and inclusion. We've heard that a lot. Um, but one of my questions was how do you have the business case for implementing things like um, certain OKRs or incentive structures or NPS and you were confused at the idea of having to have a business case internally <laughs> because it was yes. you're so far beyond yeah. having that kind of argument. Mm -hmm. uh, would you have any comments on that for us when we're, we're at a, a different <laughs> stage of development in terms of our understanding of explicit systemizing of, uh, of inclusion practices? Well, I think systemizing is very good and I thought it was interesting in the previous conversation uh, when you talked about quota and 50-50s uh, and people, this positive effort, positive, uh, what's the word? Discrimination. Thank you. Positive discrimination. But you, you don't, you rarely talk about how men positively discriminate but that's never talked about how they network internally and that's just oh you know because obviously you have a friend and you would recommend and how that has been going on for centuries but now we're like okay but we need to push, push forward an equality in the in the workplace and then you want to bring women in and then oh no it's positive discrimination mm -hmm. yeah maybe but also this has always been happening so I think that uh, I'm not I'm not saying that I'm for it and I should we should push it but I also think that we should acknowledge that um, nepotism is very real and that you do hire the people that you know uh, so I think that um, 
I, and I encourage us to do that as well. Look, look outside of our comfort zone when hiring and when talking to people. Um, I'm the fifth of six, so uh, within my own local family or my own kind of nuclear family, I'm probably a little bit lower down on the, the food chain a little bit, but still a very important role. Um, so your relationship is a team. What kind of a, and that's the question I want you to ask yourself. What kind of leader are you? Okay, are you someone who does a say, not what I do, or do you act the same way? Do you go, are you characteristic? Okay, and sometimes I even think like I'm be laughing at um, my mom at home. I've eight nephews and nieces, and there's a few toddlers going around, and the the toddler might come in and say, oh, I'm going to help with emptying the dishwasher or do some housework, and they're not helping at all, but they think they are, and they're doing something. At, you know, it's, they're actually making a mess, but they think they're doing the right thing, and they are, it will be the right thing with time. So you praise them. And sometimes I think not to equate a less skilled member of a team to a toddler, but that you praise someone who's doing the right thing, they just, and their best, because that's what's bringing everyone along in the end common goal. And if you're a leader, that's what you should be trying to do. I always say I'm an athlete, I'm not a female athlete. And I'm not, I'm a little bit of a, re a reluctant feminist when it comes to these things in that um, I don't, uh, I just want to do my thing. My partner was very supportive, asked me recently actually, he said, um, you know, would you prefer it the way it's, you know the way it's ladies football, but it's women's rugby. Which one do you think is right? And I said, football and rugby. <laughs> And he didn't mean it like he's very supportive, but she's like, oh, yeah, okay. And when it is just football and rugby, that's when I'll be happy. I mean, why are you putting an extra label on it? Um, I actually did chat, uh, kind of a mentor meeting with a, a former Irish male rugby captain, just about on-field and on off-field things. And um, I spoke about how I hate tokenism. I hate being given a chance to do something just because you're a female and now they want gender balance. And sometimes it's speaking opportunities or sometimes it's promoting a product or something like that. And if it's tokenism and I feel I'm not being there on merit, I don't want to do it. But he kind of said, you know, you might need to flip your perspective a little bit and that for so long as females, you're discriminated against the other way in that, well, you can't really do that because you're a female. Um, so now if it is flipped the other way, well, actually we need a bit of gender balance because the media are looking for it and you're the person that's been given that opportunity, take it, okay, how you got there might be a little bit of gender balance issues, but you, they'll only ask you back if you do a good job. Diversity and inclusion is a key core value of Fexco and something we don't take for granted. I really hope you really enjoyed the day.